Stanford University. All right, welcome back. It's Hacking Consciousness, session two, Consciousness and Physiology. So let's cover a few logistical things first before we get started. Um, I'm going to circulate, again, some sign-in sheets. So if you're taking this for units, please sign in. Otherwise, I don't know if you're here. So I'm going to start right here. You can Thanks, just pass it through. And also, you might have noticed, we're in a bigger room. So thanks for your feedback. Uh, I'm glad that we're much more comfortable now. It was a little bit crammed in the other room. So this should be quite a bit nicer. Uh, also, I'd like to welcome one of our course advisors that wasn't there last time, Dr. Cesar Molinas. And I mentioned him um, last time. So thank you for being here. <laughs> he's, uh, he's helped tremendously with the course and the content. So thank you very much. Um, also, many of you have asked me about the video of last session. So it's finished editing. There's just a few more logistical hurdles that we have to go through, and it will be posted on iTunes U and YouTube pretty soon. And uh, before we get started, are there any other sort of logistical questions that you have about the course, the content, anything? Yes? Is it OK to record during the lecture? Uh, sure, should be fine. Yeah. As long as our speaker is OK with that, it's fine. OK. Any other questions? Yes? Who wants to sign in even if we're not taking the course for credit? Uh, if you're not on the email list, please leave your email so that I can sort of email you. If you are, then don't worry about the sign-in. Good. Other questions? Good. Looks like we have a, a great audience today. So let's uh, start with a recap first of what we learned in session one. So we've introduced you to essentially the leitmotif or the thesis of hacking consciousness. And what Dr. John Hagelin talked about was essentially that nature is structured in layers. It starts with sort of the gross level, goes to the molecular level, atomic, subatomic. And at the basis of all of that is the unified field. And that in our thesis is consciousness. It's a field of pure being, pure intelligence, pure silence, pure bliss. And within that field is a type of programming code that really structures the other layers of nature. And so that really brings us to our next speaker, who will talk a little bit about, well, what is that programming code? And we've also talked a little bit about how you access that sort of programming code, that unified field. Dr. John Hagelin mentioned you need a t technique of transcending. And by transcending, it means you touch that field directly. And through transcending, you get a lot of benefits out of, essentially, that particular technique. There are health benefits related with it. There are mental benefits. There are social benefits and even environmental benefits associated with transcending and touching that particular field and enlivening that in all of your activity. So that brings us to our esteemed guest, Dr. Tony Nader. Thank you so much for being here. Um, a little bit of a background on Dr. Tony Nader. He received his MD from the American University of Beirut, then went on to get his PhD at MIT in cognitive and brain sciences. I actually studied cognitive science as an undergrad, so it's very close to my heart. And uh, finally, he did his postdoc at Harvard. And he became an expert in neuroscience, human physiology. And what he also found is he was really on a quest for total human knowledge. And that led him to work with uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And under his guidance, he essentially published three books to really study in very, very great detail this programming code of nature. And one of the books is called um, Veda and Vedic Literature and Human Physiology. And I'm sure Dr. Tony Neda will talk a little bit about it. But um, that's all I have to say. So please enjoy our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Tony Nader, thank you for coming. <laughs> the topic of consciousness is, is something that has recently been, uh, recently meaning in the past 30 years, uh, quite profoundly studied in science. Science in the past has limited itself to things that are usually considered physical and amenable to laws that we can analyze and study and make conclusions about. As you know, all the fields of psychology, even medicine about 100 years ago, was an art. And more recently, meaning in the past 40, 50 years, 
we start to understand that there are laws that uh, control or manage the fields not only of the physical but also of the mental. Psychology is becoming or is a science now. Even sociology, the study of behavior in a, in a group is getting to be more and more a science. Art, to some extent, is starting to be, of course, not fully a science, but analyzed scientifically in terms of what makes something beautiful or harmonious or um, pleasant or pleasing. And so even consciousness, which is something very abstract, has become as interesting to the scientists in today's time because science wants really to understand everything about who we are, where we are, and where we are going. So the study of consciousness is a field which is quite wide because of its abstract nature, consciousness lends itself mostly to philosophy. And because it is most intimate to us as human beings, we wonder where it comes from. So I would like in this session and the next one, which I will be giving also in a week, to familiarize ourselves with the field of consciousness broadly and to present to you specifically the findings and the proposals of a new way, which is actually ultimately very ancient also, of understanding what consciousness is, where this thing comes from. So we'll be on a journey of research, in a sense, together. And you should feel free to ask questions. And I want to start by saying, by modern scientific understanding, consciousness is not a problem that is yet fully resolved. So there are many hypotheses, many thoughts, and many angles. So it's a field which is very, very active. So I'm not going to be presenting to you necessarily a final conclusion about what science has decided today about what consciousness is. Although I would like to present the conclusion that I have personally <laughs> thought what consciousness is and what I feel through my personal experience and my research what this field is. So there is something to contribute as a proposal. And I have recently uh, been studying this from quite some um, even mathematical perspective, uh, which is not yet fully published, but I would like to share some of these aspects with you. First, let's see what consciousness is. What is consciousness? We have here some terms. You have looked at them, you know, awareness, alertness, attention, vigilance, focus, wakefulness. These, these are aspects of consciousness. And we want to know <coughs> how they relate to what we call consciousness. The definition of consciousness is by the factors that makes consciousness exist. What is consciousness? Is the ability to be conscious of something. But what about awareness? What, what, is there a difference between consciousness and awareness? We'll come back to that. Alertness, attention, vigilance, focus, we don't need to comment much more, but they are kind of levels of the acuity or the quality of consciousness within the wakeful state, the wakefulness state. I put conscience here, because in some languages, maybe mainly Latin languages, there is not really the term conscience for consciousness. is the only one word that they use. But conscience is something which is ethical, which is of a moral value. You have good conscience. You have bad conscience. You feel you've done the wrong thing. Whereas consciousness is just the ability to be awake and aware and able to evaluate ourselves and our environment. Now, science has found very interesting things, and that is where consciousness and awareness can be handled as different things. 
And I want to tell you already that these definitions are not set and fast. Some scientists or some philosophers might use these terms interchangeably. Some might say awareness is the ability to be aware of something, whereas consciousness is only a state. We are talking about a state of being, of being conscious and a conscious individual, where, which means you are conscious individual, but you are not aware that something is happening in the street outside, and you are still a conscious individual. The science has also discovered that sometimes an individual can be conscious and his physiology aware of something, whereas he or she is not aware of that thing on a conscious level. <laughs> what does this mean? They tried, there are some experiments that were done, and magicians use this. You can have a split screen and you project onto one eye, let's say, a person who is frowning. And on the other eye, you project some colorful kinds of rectangles that are moving around. Because of the quality of the picture, somehow your brain decides not to see the frowning person. It is being projected to the nervous system, but you don't see it, which means after the experiment is done and the person has been exposed to this um, little experiment, person is asked, did, what did you see? And they will say, I've seen the you know, colorful rectangles moving around. Did you see anything else? Absolutely not. They have literally not seen it. Yet, when you analyze what happened in their brain and physiology, if you are putting them under certain types of uh, analysis of brain functioning and brain metabolism, and certain reactions that happen in the brain that we are now able to analyze and know what's going on. In fact, the brain has seen the picture and actually reacts to it even. So you are reacting to something, which means your physiology is aware of it, and yet you are not really conscious of it. So this is just to let you know about the so many factors that actually influence our physiology and what we call our consciousness. Now, there are what we call states of consciousness. <clears throat> you can be waking, dreaming, and sleeping. These are the usual three states of consciousness. There are states of consciousness not just on the experience level, of what waking is, dreaming, and sleeping is, but also on the physiological level. Every one of these states of consciousness has a corresponding physiological activity. Your brain waves during waking and your <coughs> physiological structure are different than when you are dreaming or when you are in deep sleep. I must say the purpose of this uh, course or talk is not to make you either a neuroscientist or a philosopher of, of consciousness, but to open to the awareness the different areas that are being discussed. So there is no point for me to say, for example, in what way waking is different from dreaming, different from sleeping on a physiological level. You have to believe me that they are different. <laughs> if you are really interested, of course, we can discuss any of these points. So these are states of consciousness. Now, within these states of consciousness, you have variations, what we can call impaired states of consciousness. For example, anesthesia is not a normal state of consciousness that is usually known. You give somebody some chemicals, and then the brain goes into a certain type of functioning, and then, you know, is not really conscious. And it has also its own physiological changes. There are states which we call locked-in state, which nobody would really ever want to be in. It's a terrible state from a medical standpoint. 
Who knows what that is? Anybody has an idea? Okay, so not too many. So let me tell you what it is. Some movie was there, I think, uh, at one point where what happens is in locked state is the whole physiology is paralyzed. There are some areas in the brain, nervous system, stem, brain stem, etc., that can be paralyzed or due to chemicals or something that has happened. And therefore, the body is completely locked. But the brain is aware. So one is imprisoned within one's own body. It's a terrible state. It's not something, you know, I, I personally would rather be in coma than in a locked state. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we know, no one of us has to go there. But there is another state which is called minimally conscious state. And this minimally conscious state is a state where the brain is going through the cycles of waking, dreaming, and sleeping. Yet, the individual is in a sort of what we call vegetative state. Okay? Why I'm telling you all this? It's because this is part of the whole debates about consciousness and the physiology. And if you want to understand consciousness, it's good to know these different states of consciousness, these different impaired states of consciousness, so that we can make a judgment about what is influencing what and where this comes from or the other thing comes from. So this minimally conscious state is medically a state in which the individual physiologically goes through waking, dreaming, and sleeping. And therefore, if you do analysis of the brain waves and the physiological changes, you can tell this person is now sleeping. In deep sleep, this person is now dreaming, and this person is now awake. Yet what you have in front of you on a medical level is somebody who's very minimally responsive, which means can barely say, move the eyes, Many times you have to say they would move the eyes, look at the right, maybe they look at the right, and then they fall asleep. Pinch me, they can try to pinch you or not. And that is minimally conscious state. The vegetative state is a state in which some aspects of these states of consciousness are available, but the person is totally non-responsive. Totally non-responsive, which means pinch me, turn the eyes, you talk to them, and you have no idea whether they hear you or not, or whether they are conscious of anything or not. And their cycles of waking, dreaming, and sleeping are disturbed. The person who is in a coma state is a person who actually doesn't go through waking, dreaming, and sleep cycles. So when you hear somebody is in coma, then you know if you analyze their physiology, you find this person is just in one state, a minimal state, which is even more minimal than the minimally conscious state. Okay? So this gives us an idea of all of these gradations of different levels of consciousness. So to be just complete in our we are still defining consciousness <laughs> and what kinds of consciousness we can face. So you have, of course, altered states of consciousness, which can be altered by chemicals, hallucinogens. There are people who live lucid dreams. Lucid dream, which means you are actually dreaming. You know you're dreaming, but you control the dream. And you can extend it further. You can uh, reduce it. And you can enjoy it if you're enjoying it. And it's actually dreaming, yet you are controlling the dream. You are, you know, if somebody's dreaming of flying, they'll say, oh, I want to fly more, let's fly more, like that. Some people who are awakened sometimes during lucid dream, they might wake up because there is some noise or something, and then they have the ability to fall asleep again and continue the dream. And it's not cheating. It's actually dreaming. <laughs> it's a real state of consciousness. If you analyze it, you know they're actually dreaming. Another kind of state of consciousness which is also altered is sleepwalking, which you all have heard about. You know, somebody is literally sleeping, which is 
in this case, the contrary of almost the lucid dream, where there is a conscious awareness of controlling something. But in sleepwalking, the person is actually sleeping. The brain is sleeping, the physiology is sleeping, but the person is walking. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes these uh, patients are quite also violent because there is some disturbance there. So there is a great association of, I mean, a, a higher association of violence during w sleepwalking. Hypnosis, of course, is another state in which the individual is awake, but his 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 decision-making as a little bit under the control of the hypnotist. So all of these are variations of what we call consciousness. Now, there are people who have religious, spiritual experience of ecstasy and communion with the divine or something like this extraordinary. These are also some kinds of experiences. And there are experiences of what we call transcending nirvana or samadhi, if you have heard of this, which is a state of pure consciousness being experienced by itself. In these states, the individual does not have any specific experience of any particular object or thought, but just experience consciousness itself. So as if consciousness is experiencing itself. There are millions of people who actually have been studied and have reported this transcending through particularly the transcendental meditation technique, where they have these moments of awareness and consciousness, yet without an object of consciousness except consciousness itself. So it's like consciousness looking at its own self. And what is interesting is that in these states of consciousness, like transcending, you actually also have a different physiology. Like we said, for sleep, waking, and dreaming, there are different physiologies. In the transcendental state, in this state where there is this deep transcending, there is also a different physiology, different brain functioning, much more coherence in different parts of the brain, right and left, back and forth. And there are very profound transformation and very deep rest in the physiology. The physiology is much more restful than even deep sleep, yet the awareness is very, very high. There is very high awareness with very deep rest. So all of these define the differences between what we call different states of consciousness. So when we look at consciousness, therefore, we have these possibilities, which are consciousness being a relative state which is changing. And the relative means it's object referral, meaning it's referring itself to some thought, some activity, some functioning. And we have what we can call absolute state of consciousness, which is a non-changing, pure self-referral reality. The question that we have before us is, is consciousness a something? Is it a something? Or is it just a product of language, a product of the brain due to situations and circumstances and due to transformations and changes in brain activity? And that's what modifies it. There is a lot of evidence, of course, to suggest the intimate relationship between consciousness and physiology. There is no doubt that when something happens in the physiology, something takes place in consciousness also. There is no doubt that when there is something that takes place in consciousness, something also happens in the physiology. If you are walking somewhere and you see something that is scary, even if by itself is not scary, but you just analyze it in your brain, and we usually give the example if you have a rope in the night and you're walking on the street and there is a rope, some rope somewhere, and you tumble on it and you think, let's say, it's a snake. It's not an everyday occurrence in downtown San Francisco, but <laughs> it can happen, you know, somewhere in the forest. And then you are scared. The fear, because of your mind thinking, oh, I am facing a snake, there is a, there is a fear, the fear creates changes in your physiology, and the physiology can go through lots of transformations. 
What happens in this is what we usually call the psychoneuro uh, um, hormonal <laughs> endocrine uh, immune system reaction. So there is this axis, psychoneuro endocrino immunological <laughs> physiological reaction, which means from the mind to the brain to the hormonal system to transformations in the body. So this axis exists this way, and it exists the other way also. You might eat the wrong thing, take some pills or some chemicals, and your whole consciousness is transformed. Like we have in anesthetics, or we have in hallucinogens, or we have in anything you know, that happens physiologically, physically, it also leads to a different experience on the level of consciousness. So the intimate relationship, that's what we call the changing object referral consciousness. The other question is, is there something that we call absolute state of consciousness? We'll come back to this because that's very important in our study and the attempt to hack consciousness, that we have to have all of these factors kind of available to us because the more variables we have, the better we can actually analyze consciousness. This chart shows the different here and there, conditions and states of consciousness, and where they stand in terms of what we call levels of arousal. So along the x-axis, we have the levels of arousal. And on this side, we have the awareness of the environment, or the awareness of the self, self-awareness, or environment awareness. So there is something physiological and something on the level of consciousness and something on the level of the awareness of the individual. We don't need to go through all of this, but you can have these and look at this chart a little bit. We take just a half a minute or 15 seconds so that you have an idea where these things stands one with the other. You have any questions on that? Perhaps we could ask again if anyone has AAA batteries? <laughs> uh, it's not working? It works on this one, but it's weak. It's OK. I mean, the slides are simple enough, I guess. OK? So this slide is clear. It can also be presented. Some scientists present it like this. And this slide shows the relationship between different states of consciousness and metabolism in the brain, how the brain metabolizes uh, different uh, use of oxygen mainly during these different states of consciousness. For example, you can see here this one is zero because you take the margin here. This is brain death. There is, of course, no consumption of oxygen. The one on the right is the usual awareness, normal consciousness. You have this kind of reference of how much consumption is. This is to say that there are techniques that study the activities of the brain. And we have a relationship between the level of alertness, arousal, awareness, and how much the brain actually consumes uh, energy, consumes oxygen. Okay, when you are awake, you consume more. When you are not awake, you consume less. Could you explain what the colors mean, the yellow and the red and the blue? Uh, yes, the colors mean more or less oxygen consumption. Okay. You no, know, so like, uh, of so course. Black no. Hmm? Black would be no. Yeah, the lower, the darker is the less, less utilization. And it shows in which areas there are more or less. So in fact, the color is just not only to differentiate the total amount of oxygen utilization, because the total amount is on the y-axis. But the, the brain is colored to show the differences between different parts of the brain and where it is more, where it is less. OK? Now, <clears throat> information processing, how we as humans process information, we process them consciously or subconsciously. 
So there is what we call implicit perception and implicit learning. Not all that what you learn is a consciously learned process. When there is a novel experience, something interesting, something new, the areas of the brain that are related to consciousness are activated and you get more metabolism, more oxygen consumption in those areas. But once you have learned what you're learning, it seems the brain takes it down back to lower levels of the nervous system and stores it there in terms of memory. And then you don't have to use as much oxygen or metabolism to uh, activate those areas of the higher level of awareness and consciousness, and things become automatic. It's like, you know, familiarity with riding a bicycle or driving a car. At the beginning, there is a lot of attention, and you have to consciously make sure what you're doing is happening properly. And then gradually, it becomes a reflex activity. So there, are, there is in the nervous system different levels of the learning process that ultimately when the process is well learned, it becomes more on a lower level. This is one aspect. The other aspect is that we learn a lot subconsciously also without having a conscious awareness of something we learn from subconscious levels. So there is also the unconscious. And I'm bringing these out so that you become familiar with these terms in the field of consciousness. All of these are important. What is awareness? What is consciousness? What is subconscious? What is unconscious? And what happens in these different values? And these are all the topics that are usually discussed when we are studying and analyzing consciousness. Now, there is another level, which is scientists differentiate between what is called background consciousness and the actual consciousness. The background consciousness is the sense of self, who you are, where you are. You're conscious of being Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so or Ms. So-and-so. You, you have an identity. You have a name. You see yourself as being something, a role that you play or a status that you have. This is plays in the background consciousness. And then you have the actual consciousness, which are your intentions, your wishes, your emotions, your thinking, and all of these aspects of activity that are also related to consciousness. Now, there is an individual consciousness, and there is the other's consciousness. OK, so now we're starting into the having defined the issues in general that we have at hand. We're going to start to get into some problems that even science is facing today. For example, it sounds obvious to say my consciousness, your consciousness. But how can you ever tell that I have a consciousness? Anybody can be sure that anybody else in this room has consciousness? It's a big problem in science. Nobody can be sure at all. I could be the only one who has consciousness. <laughs> and all of you are zombies. <laughs> how can I tell? You laugh because you know how to laugh. Because if a joke is there, you laugh. If I pinch you, you cry, you yell. You know, it's just completely an automaton. And if you ask, do you have consciousness? Say, of course I have consciousness. But who says they're not lying? Or what is their, that is their assessment of what consciousness is or what their consciousness is. It's a very interesting aspect. Consciousness is one of the most intimate aspects of our life because without consciousness, we can't do anything at all. We can't evaluate anything at all, except, of course, if we are a zombie or a computer. Now, the question becomes, what is the consciousness of a monkey? What is the consciousness of a tree? Do they have consciousness? And that, these are questions that, actually, I would like to try to answer as we go along in this, uh, in this 
seminar. Now, <clears throat> now we come to the issues of consciousness and how scientists have finally thought there is two things in consciousness. There is the easy problem and there is the hard problem. The easy problem of consciousness is as easy as figuring out how many galaxies are in the universe, how many universes are in our universe, what is at the basis of the Higgs boson, um, you know, what makes uh, life evolve as it is, uh, where do we come from? So it says the easy problem, it's actually quite difficult. But why it's easy? It's because it says that there is an aspect of consciousness that we will one day be able for certain to be able to grasp. That is when I look at the red flower, I can tell, and I'm, as we are studying it, that there are some photons of a certain frequency that travel in the electromagnetic field, very complex things, but they are true. They go through my retina, they hit my eyes, they excite some neurons, they inhibit other neurons. These neurons release some chemicals and lead to an electrical activity that goes to this part of the brain, that part of the brain, to my visual cortex. From my visual primary cortex, it goes to the second visual area, association area, to the third. It combines to my memory, with my memory knowing that this is like that. And I say, this is a red flower. All of this is the easy problem. There's no problem with one day finding it. We don't know all the details, but more and more science is discovering this. So the easy problem is rather easy in that sense. The difficult problem is, how do I subjectively experience the redness of the red? How do I personally get conscious of being conscious of what I'm doing? How is this possible? Where this abstract reality comes from this very physical activity of our nervous system. And today science has absolutely no clue. So that's why I like to give an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> and we will get to this. But before we get that, let's a little bit look at Again, consciousness from these different perspectives, and we'll come back to that. And let's look at the easy problem. The way the scientists want to resolve the easy problem is by looking at what we call the neuronal correlates, the neural correlates of consciousness. And that's where cognitive science is, where there are different techniques of electroencephalography, magnetic encephalography, positron emission tomography, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and other techniques that actually today allow us to study fine details inside the brain so that today we are actually able to some extent to even know what the person is overall thinking even. Because you can tell somebody think that you're playing tennis and you look in the brain, and there are very specific areas that are activated just by thinking, I'm playing tennis and being on the court, hitting the ball. There are these very specific parts of the brain that are activated. And we have such an ability to detect now which are the parts that are being activated, and such very fast uh, computers that can analyze all of these and put them in algorithms that we can say this person is thinking of playing tennis, or this person is thinking now of walking in their home, or walking on the street, or thinking of something nice, or something uh, not so nice. So we are able actually to follow these uh, thoughts inside the brain, and this has, has been hel very helpful in the study of coma and vegetative states, because these patients, we, they sit there and it's a big suffering for them and the family and we want to know, is this person really aware of something? Are they suffering or is it just, just you know, a vegetable sitting there? 
And that's something which you can do. You can take them inside the machine, and like a positron emission tomography, and tell them, now think of playing tennis. Usually, you don't see anything with the person when you tell them, think of playing tennis. In the past 20 years, we couldn't have any clue of whether they hear you or not, whether they respond or not. And that's where we started to differentiate between minimally states, minimally conscious states, for example, and coma and vegetative states. They started to have gradations. Because some of these patients that we used to think they have absolutely no consciousness, you put them in the machine, and you say, think of playing tennis. And the parts of the brain that actually are a normal subject lit up during thinking of playing tennis, they get lit up in this particular patient. So this is one technique which is used to start to know to what extent the patient is aware of what, even though outside is just nothingness is there. <coughs> there are other techniques where you fire um, uh, magnetic uh, input on one part of the brain or the other, and you follow it, and you see how it reverberates. Those who have consciousness normally it doesn't just go in, but it actually reverberates and goes through different parts of the brain. So this is the way we study the easy problem. We look at the neuronal correlates of consciousness. And in this, we have, of course, aware that these parts of the human nervous system are involved in consciousness. In general, the brain, of course, and more specifically, the cortical area, the cortex of the brain, and more specifically, inside the cortex of the brain, the areas which we call the associative regions, the associative areas of the brain. And within that, uh, more deep values of the physiology, we have the thalamus and other subcortical areas and the reticular formation. <clears throat> this is um, the brain with, in different colors, the different sensory areas that we receive information for hearing, for touch, for vision, and where areas we activate our motor function. What you have here is two things. There are areas in the brain that receive the primary information. For example, in the visual cortex, when you see a flower, the, the input from the flower comes to the back of the brain. It's called the occipital lobe. And there is a V1 region, which is the primary visual cortex, that receives the information. But you actually are not conscious of this information when in, it's in this area. It goes to a second area, which is called the associative area for vision. And there is where you start actually being conscious of seeing the flower. So this area here is the primary visual cortex. And this area here is where you become conscious of seeing the flower. Okay? If you damage this area, you will not see the flower. You become, one becomes blind. But funnily enough, you are aware of the object that is in front of you. So there are these blind recognition of objects, which means uh, we don't need to go into this very much. But when these areas are damaged, you can present something in front of the patient and tell them, what do you see? He says, nothing. I'm blind. It doesn't see anything. Absolutely nothing. Now you put several objects on the table, and you say, choose the object that you think maybe I have shown you or I have asked you about by touching it. So the patient goes, touches, and in every case, would choose the right object. So the brain was aware, even though the eyes didn't see. And so this is how we make conclusions about which parts of the brain are related to consciousness. And the parts of the brain most related to consciousness are not necessarily the primary areas. This is what we see here, primary areas of perception. But the association areas that are near 
and there are first level, second level, third level association areas that are related to consciousness. So this is another, the same picture, but in a clearer way. Now, you have to be awake at least to be conscious. And this is where there is a modulator in the human nervous system that modulates the level of awareness. That's usually the reticular formation, which is a part in this part of the brain stem. This, by the way, of course, is the cortex in the brain for those who think it's a mushroom. <laughs> And this is um, where the reticular formation is. What the reticular formation does, it modulates consciousness. It's like a thermostat that turns up and down your level of awareness. So when you're drowsy or sleepy, this part is turning the thermostat down or turning it up to wake you up. All the sensory aspects of our physiology bring information pass first to the reticular formation and then send their information to the cortex. Okay? When you're sleeping and you have your alarm to wake you up, this is where this happens. This is the culprit. <laughs> this is the one that suddenly turns the whole thing up and you wake up. The brain wakes up. It's not that you hear the alarm. In the, in the brain and you realize it is conscious and now you have to wake up and then you wake up, it actually works the other way around. The alarm sets the, uh, excites the reticular formation. The reticular formation opens the doors of perception and then you say, okay, I am awake and there is an alarm and I have to go to work, okay? So these are important things so that we, anal we understand the elements, again, that are involved in the study of consciousness. Now, there is what we call selective consciousness, which, as we said, is dependent on attention, how much attention we put or something, how much interest and how much novelty there is in it. There is the example of picture camouflage that I have given you at the beginning, which shows that there is a selective ability of the brain to decide where to go or where not to see and what to see. But the brain is still influenced by these factors, even though we don't consciously see them. And that's what we have in terms of subconscious processing in the nervous system. So also decisions, reflex actions, and subcortical memory are things that are stored in us, but are no more a conscious process. The body, like if you want to juggle some six, seven, eight balls in the air, it's impossible. There is no time for the brain to analyze this and to do it. So what happens is you first learn it, and your brain and cortical areas will be very active in this, and then gradually, it gets stored in subcortical areas, lower parts of the nervous system, and then you don't have to think about it. So when your arms are moving and your muscles are moving and you're juggling as if you are analyzing every motion of every ball, it has absolutely nothing to do with this. It's an automation. A computer would have done the same. It's literally become an automation inside the nervous system. Now, another aspect of consciousness which is very important is the self. And the self, we can say there are two kinds of self in terms of physiology. There is the physical self and the cognitive self. And some, like some scientists, like Damasio, tries to say that there are three values, the proto-self, which is related to the bodily function and homeostasis. And that is in the brainstem area and the hypothalamus in the lower parts of the brain. There is the core self, which is in the midbrain and the amygdala area, which is related to visceral activities, to emotions. And then there is the cortex, where you have language, speech, and higher values, cognitive values of what we understand to be the self. 
Now, scientists also analyze the factor of time in terms of consciousness, what the moments of consciousness are. And I wanted to say this also, so you have a complete overview, at least, of what the topics are. It takes about 30 to 50 milliseconds for any information to reach the brain, and then about 150 milliseconds to process it. And by the time you're conscious of something, it takes a quarter of a second. So when you're living around in real time, you should realize you are always a quarter of a second behind. <laughs> OK? And there are factors which are called masking. Masking, which means if you put things in fast repetition, it seems the brain masks the information. So that if the repetition is faster than the minimal conscious time, you can have what is called backward masking or forward masking, which means some things you will actually never see. You think you're looking at something, it's happening continuously, but some things you see, something you actually don't see. Because those who have not had the time within this framework of time to be processed, they are masked, because there is no time to process them. Okay? So we've analyzed anatomy, physiology, the timing, and consciousness and its neural correlates and which areas it is available. And the fact that the brain and the physiology has very specific parts that deal with very specific things. And that much we are aware. And all of this, which seems maybe somewhat complicated, is really part of the most basic aspects of the easy problem. Sometimes people, based on timing, we have patients that have a sense of cine cinematographic vision, which means they actually, in certain diseases or certain lesions of the brain, you can see things as if you don't know this. It's not your time, but in the old time, when I was your age, <laughs> sometimes you go to these movies and the film, which was running, gets burnt or something, and then it starts coming very slow. You start seeing picture by picture, and that's, you know, is. Uh, the, some patients, when they have certain lesions, they start experiencing the world like this, picture by picture almost. So this can also happen. There is something which you might be familiar with also, and that is whenever there is an accident that happens, you feel as if time slows down. You have heard this. You know, if somebody's going on a bicycle and they st struck something or there is a ac car accident, they feel as if the whole time became so slow, and you become very much aware of the very details in a long, as if a long way. You've seen it happen. It takes its time. And whereas it usually happens in a fraction of a moment. OK? So all of these are aspects of perceptions and aspects of the easy problem. I felt I had to cover the easy problem with you so you know what the problem the problem of consciousness in science is, and how modern science is dealing with it, how modern science is trying to handle it. And we have seen all of these different values. Now we come to the most uh, challenging, yet I feel most fascinating aspect of the topic, and that is the heart problem. The heart problem about consciousness. What is consciousness? The heart problem is sometimes referred to qualia. Qualia are these moments of experience, like the feelings that one has, that are very personal and subjective and intimate. <coughs> the feeling of what the redness of the red means to you, what the flower actually gives you in terms of sensations and feelings and emotions. What makes us humans? What makes us individual who have decision-making ability, who have choices, who have beliefs, who have all of these different values. And of course, there are scientists that try to say that this ultimately will be also found to be in the nervous system. And in these, there are two general categories of scientists. One say that is the grandmother cells in the brain. What this means is. Um, you know, you want to see a flower, okay? 
The flower has millions of specific things. It has a color, it has a shape, it has an idea about it, it has a smell, it is at a certain distance from you. All of this Millions of bits of information, they go through your brain and they start getting distilled, distilled, distilled. And at the end, they go from like a pyramid, from the bottom of the pyramid, up and up and up to the top of the pyramid. Which means they first involve millions and millions of neurons and then they keep getting refined. This is, this is a plant, this is... Uh, a tree, this is a flower, this is what kind of flower, etc., until you get to the final one cell that would say this is such and such. For example, in face recognition, human recognition, you know, you see somebody, it's not a, it's not a monkey, it's a human being. And then, okay, that's a category. And then uh, it's not a, a lady, it's a man. It's not uh, any man, it's a man that I know. Um, I know the features. Yes, it's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> so there is one grandmother cell for your brother, one for your sister, one for your friend, one for your teacher, one for the classroom people. This is a theory, huh? this is not. And therefore, they say, okay, it gets distilled down, and then you get to that one cell. When that one cell is activated, you recognize that it's that situation or that individual. And there are others who say, no, no, it's a neuronal synchronization. What's actually happening is that a large number of neurons, they get together, and they take the information, they analyze it, and based on their collective functioning, they decide it's your brother or sister or your friend. Okay, and consciousness, therefore, is seen as the integration of these neuronal activities, and it's informational. With the advent of quantum mechanics, there are now more scientists who say, why don't we see consciousness as being a quantum mechanical phenomenon? Which means it's not classical, it's something that takes us to deeper levels of nature, and you have heard from Dr. Hagelin, what quantum mechanics is and different layers of brain and activity are. Okay, in this, in this quantum mechanics, you know, there is a famous uh, analysis that it's some microtubules in the brain that seem to have some quantum mechanical activity, and therefore if they are all together integrated, they create something which is more than the sum of its parts, and that is what consciousness is about. Now, consciousness is not only the hard questions that we have to analyze. It gets us into all kinds of issues about life and nature and living and decision making. And that's why you see these values of, are we, do we have free will? If there are laws of nature that determine everything, are we a free thinking, free willing, free deciding people, which involves consciousness? Or is there a determinism? Because if you know the initial conditions and there are strict laws of nature, when you go through this, uh, this sequence of cause and effect, you seem to have absolutely no choice. Everything is completely deterministic. <coughs> is there law and order in the universe? Is creation something that has led to consciousness? Or is it chaos and somehow consciousness appeared out of matter? And then are these classical and quantum mechanical values that are involved? And there is all what we call sensory experience versus intellectual reasoning. Which means, do we trust our senses? Or do we have to trust our logic, our reason? One of the core aspects of the heart problem of consciousness is mind-body relationship, or matter and consciousness, physiology and intelligence. Are these two related? Are these two the same? Is one producing the other? So you have heard from Raja Hagelin that matter what we call matter, if we want to solve the problem of consciousness from the perspective of material reality, 
Matter is made out of atoms, particles, elementary particles, and then fields. And then you have the unified field and the singularity of natural law. And in all of these, in coming to the solution of the heart problem, I want to point out the relative nature of our ability to, number one, experience on the sensory level, and number two, even reasoning in our ability to reason. It was, there was a time when the Earth was the center of the universe. This geocentric vision has led to very complicated issues and problems in understanding the movement of the planets, etc. There was a time where space and time were also considered immutable, non-changeable. Okay, now we know the world is not like that. It's all probabilities and wave functions. And to whatever extent you would be interested, we can go into this. The quantum understanding of quantum decoherence, the Copenhagen interpretation about the importance of how the observer can collapse the wave function so that particles which were supposed to be in all different places suddenly is found in one place. And then the issues of singularity and the unified field of all the laws of nature. These are very interesting topics, and they've been discussed over and over again. They do have a relevance to the study of consciousness, because whatever image we have of our universe will influence how we can analyze this very important part of our existence, which actually is the tool that we use to understand and to get knowledge about ourselves and the universe. So there are two kinds of realities <clears throat> that we face in our understanding. Some are material, changing, <coughs> and others are considered <coughs> non-changing, non-material. This gives us two kinds of sources of knowledge. Also, there is subjective knowledge and objective knowledge. The objective knowledge means science and analysis and scientific uh, study, and the subjective knowledge, which is things that come from our intellects and reasoning and analysis intellectually. So what is reality, ultimately? What is our perception? Is it an illusion, a fantasy? Is it a dream? When we analyze things from quantum mechanical perspective, we realize that the world that we observe through our senses is really not what it seems to be. That our nervous system is only a machine that, depending on how good it works or how bad it works, will give us a different sensory experience and a different ability to <coughs> reason and decide about it. How many are not at all familiar with like wave function and quantum mechanics? They have no idea what this is. OK. <laughs> How many think that this uh, bottle is actually sitting here on the table? <laughs> <laughs> Almost everybody. <laughs> Can it be in another universe? So these questions are real questions that physicists, not just to waste time and because they are bored, ask. <laughs> but they actually ask these questions. Is the cat dead or alive? And they have found, after big discussions, that the cat could be dead and alive at the same time. It has a probability to be dead, and it has a probability to be alive. But when you come to observe it, you observe it, your observation collapses the wave function, and the dead you will be finding as either dead or alive. Some will say that's ridiculous. And what is their answer to the big question? They have no answer. They say, the, dead, the cat is actually dead in this universe, 
and alive in another universe. You think I'm making jokes, but this is what most scientists of physics today spend time trying to resolve. Because the equations, the equations that they have, show this to be the reality. There is no way out of it. An electron, a particle, has a probability of some sort to be anywhere in the universe. Anywhere. More probability to be this place, a little less there, a little more there. But when you observe it or measure it, they say you collapse the wave function, and then you see it to be here in that particular position. This is real physics. It's not philosophy. What this tells us that our senses are only a very small portion of what the true reality is. You wake up in the morning, you see the sun coming from the east and going to the west. You say the sun is moving in the sky. That's what your senses tell you. Now you look at the planets that move in the sky, and you see them sometimes going forward, sometimes going backward. It drives you crazy. You try to make all kinds of analysis, and it doesn't solve the problem. Why the planets go back and forth? Why they sometimes stop and then move, and one sometimes move this way, and the other time move that way? And that drove crazy lots of people who were trying to understand the movement of planets about a few thousand years ago, or even less than that, much less than that. And the reason was because their concept in their mind of the reality of life was wrong. They were thinking this, uh, the Earth is the center of the universe, and everything is moving around it. So why these things go back and forth? It doesn't work. They had to have a complete revolution. They had a hard problem. And that hard problem could not be solved with the dogmatic belief that the Earth is the geocenter of the universe, that the universe is centered around the Earth. There had to be somebody who said very quietly <laughs> that it's actually the sun, and we are turning around it. And they took them to prison and took care of them in different ways. So, you know. They dare to say something different than the common belief. And <clears throat> yet, this is how the problem of the movement of the planets was solved. Because the planets are moving back and forth only because when they rotate around the sun, and you are sitting here, and you are rotating around the sun, at some point, because they go faster, or they are in this position or that position, they seem to be moving back. But when you are in another place, they seem to be moving forward. The problem was solved very, very easily when you change some paradigm, some belief that was very strongly held. When they started to analyze the speed of light and all of these conditions of how light hits where and the movement of light and whether it's used, there were very complex findings that was impossible to solve, absolutely impossible to solve. So the problem was really a hard problem, how it was solved. Somebody said, look, stop thinking that time and space are something rigid. They're actually flexible. They move. They dilate. Time dilates. Space dilates. You know, even if we say this today, people believe you are crazy. What do you mean? This table can be suddenly shrinking and then suddenly extending? Yes, it can. It absolutely can. It depends on your speed. If you go very fast, it will do something. If you go very slow, it will do something else. But since we are moving only usually within certain ranges of speed, you see space to be very solid. The room is very solid. We go through our life with a certain body. It doesn't seem to expand or dilate. Time seems to be going on the clock. When you have a meeting, you come on time. There is no problem. But if you start moving at the speed of light or near it, things will completely change. Space will dilate. Time will change also, will dilate. This is counterintuitive in a sense, because our senses teach us something 
and the reality is something else. In quantum mechanics today, the findings actually tell us, literally, that we could be sitting in different universes at the same time, that we could have different outcome for everything we do at the same time, or else that our consciousness is collapsing the wave function, and there is no way to explain this really uh, except with, uh, with values and analysis that is beyond anything we know in classical physics. Of course, there are theories of quantum decoherence that any measurement can do it. We don't need to go about this. But this slide tells us really that there is more to what our senses see. And science is discovering that the reality is not as we have always thought it to be. So what can we trust? Our senses, our mind, our intellect, mathematics, logic, reasoning, scientific experimentation, or what? Now, of course, we can trust our scientific experimentation, but in relative terms, which means under those conditions, under those situations, in our universe, under those situations, this is what the reality is. But in terms of trying to find things as what is consciousness, what is absolute reality, what is ultimate truth, the problem is much more complicated. For us human, what is certain in these circumstances? One thing only is certain. Only one and one thing only, that we are conscious. The physical body depends who you're asking. If you ask a classical physicist, it's something. If you ask a quantum physicist, it's something else. If you look at it from your eyes with a certain ability to see at a certain wavelength of light, etc., you see something. If you analyze it with <coughs> electron microscope or with some kind of <coughs> magnetic field, it will be different. So the way we see things and perceive things is very, very uncertain from all even modern scientific understanding. What is certain and only certain is that we are conscious. And that is why, if you know Descartes, of course, said cogito ergo sum, which means I think, therefore I am, which means that this is the one thing I am sure about, and that's why I can for sure say that I exist. It's because I have consciousness. Now, the origins of consciousness, I won't get you through all of these, but these are all the kinds of theories. Basically, they can be summarized in two different big categories. Categories of dualism or pluralism, which means <clears throat> there are two realities or many in life. One of them is physical, the other one is spiritual, is the mind, consciousness. They are two different realities. And that's what Descartes said, and these two, they interact with each other. How they interact with each other, no had, nobody has any idea. Or you have the monistic perspective, in which you have two kinds of approaches. One is what is called physicalism or materialism. And these are the idea that there is only the physical reality which is real. Everything else comes from it, which means your consciousness comes from it, uh, your feelings come from it, your everything. Uh, if there is a soul, it comes from the matter, material life. Everything is material. And there is the other side of monism, the idealism, is that there is only spiritual value and everything else is an illusion. And there is what is called the neutral monism, which says that there is one thing, we don't know what it is, and from that thing everything else comes. Okay? Now, you have seen maybe with Dr. Hagelin this chart. It's called the unified field chart. And 
if we start analyzing matter and the material life, we find that from society to an individual, then you have organs, organ system, which means you're asking yourself, what are we made of? What are we made of even physically? And as you look deeper and deeper into what science discovered, you find that ultimately particles go into elementary particles, into fields. The fields are unified <coughs> into one unified field of all the laws of nature. So science is taking us to this singularity, singularity which means one reality of one field that is the source of all other aspects of the material universe. This one reality is called the unified field or the singularity in some ways. And on the mind level, you have the knowledge and experience by those who have practiced techniques like transcendental meditation, who say that if you close the eyes and let the mind settle down, and it does settle down, and you have millions of people who have experienced this state, they reach a state where they have pure consciousness, a state of pure experience, which is non-specific, which is holistic, and which is pure existence, pure being. So the theory is that this unified field of consciousness is the same unified field of the material existence, which means there is one field of life which when it reverberates, it creates the magnetic field, the electric field, the weak force, strong force. And then these, when they reverberate, interact together, they appear as particles. And when they collect together, they appear as atoms and molecules. And molecules gather together. They become tissues and organs and organ systems and the human body and the society and the entire universe. So. The solution about consciousness that I like to propose to you is that consciousness with a big C, an uppercase C, is singularity. It is the unified field of all the laws of nature. That brings a lot of issues and problems that have to be solved. But for now, this is the assumption. We're starting from that perspective. So there is something out there that is consciousness. That's the proposed solution. That consciousness is actually primary. It doesn't depend on anything. It doesn't come from anywhere. It is not the product of physical activity of anything. And actually, it does not even create anything physical. Because the main problem that we face in science is not as much the theory that there is something abstract out there, whatever it is that we can call consciousness, and something that exists like that beyond time and space, the problem is how this something which is non-physical brings about the physical. That's the main problem. How is it possible that something non-physical creates something physical? Where did it get its energy from? Where did it get its matter from? One solution is, it's God, and you don't know. It's a mystery. <laughs> he created it, and that's it. It's a solution. It's a solution. The proposed solution is, actually, there is a consciousness. This consciousness is primary. And my proposal to you is nothing came out of it. The big problem is how we are here and talking about it. Where did we come from? Okay, it's a big problem. I'm afraid the solution will come in the next session. I want to <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make sure that if my session, the first one was a little boring, that you still come back. <laughs> but I felt I had to cover with you these problems of consciousness. It's not fair that you as a student in Stanford University come to a a seminar about hacking consciousness and not be exposed to the issues that scientists and philosophers are asking today. And even in this brief introduction, if you have learned everything I said, 
you have really a very deep grasp of all the issues, maybe not individually and in their detail, of what are things that are being discussed in this area. OK? I'll not leave you without anything. So we have a simple, what I like to call, hard solution. We had a hard problem, hard problem of knowing how is it possible that consciousness comes? How is it possible that the physical creates something so abstract like consciousness? That was, and that is, the hard problem of modern science. The hard solution is that consciousness is all that there is. It's simple because it's a simple proposition. Theoretically, it's very simple. It's very hard because consciousness, in this case, is both singularity, which means one reality, and plurality, which is all of us. Because we exist, and how we exist. We have consciousness, how we have consciousness, how it comes about. So this, what I call hard solution, is simple also because consciousness is most familiar and most intimate to us. And because we said this is the one thing we are certain about. We are conscious. We are certain about this. This is the only one thing we can be certain about. It is hard because what we trust most, which is our senses, is being proposed to you that this is deceptive. You're being deceived by your senses. Now, it's also simple because it solves many issues. If consciousness is absolute and non-changing, it does not have to come from anywhere, <clears throat> and does not have to go to anywhere. And so the problem that you always ask and continue to ask about yourself, what was before that, is solved. <laughs> because there was nothing before, and nothing came, and nothing after. There is absolutely nothing. <laughs> so the problem is really solved. That's very simple. But it's hard because there is unity and diversity at the same time. There is something which is manifest and non-manifest at the same time. So we have to solve all of these problems. Okay, these are issues that I have alluded to before, which required hard solutions. It was hard to come from the geocentric to the heliocentric uh, problem. Why was it was easy? Because it was enough to get out of the dogma that the Earth is the center of the universe. But it was hard because it changed so many beliefs and so many things about the senses. You wake up in the morning. You see the sun moving in the sky. You don't see yourself moving around the sun. And therefore, it was difficult to accept, difficult to digest. In space-time, it's very difficult also to understand how space and time are actually variables and vary with, they are relative, they're not absolute. <coughs> so I think time uh, is over soon. Uh, we have about five minutes. But... For five minutes. <coughs> so uh, either I can continue or I leave time for questions. <coughs> what do you like? <laughs> <laughs> so we can continue next time, take five minutes of questions. To give you a hint, how am I going to solve this problem? The problem is solved by the fact that consciousness is what? It's consciousness. <laughs> it's not just nothingness. It's nothingness material. It's nothingness physical. It's nothingness by any kind of quantum mechanical value or you know, not try to look for tubules or anything. Quantum mechanical is also physical. By the way, physicalism and materialism. People used to talk about materialism, but since now we moved into the quantum mechanics, so there is physicalism. It's neither physicalism nor materialism. It is just one kind of abstract reality, which is consciousness. The solution comes in the fact that it is consciousness. The fact that it is consciousness creates three values within it. Because to be conscious is to be conscious of something. 
Otherwise, why is consciousness? Why not call it, I don't know, something else? It is consciousness means it's conscious of what? Itself. It's conscious of itself. There is nothing else but itself. It's the only thing that there is. But it has three values. Why? Because there is an observer, there is an observed, and for the observer to look at the observed, there must be a way, a connection between them. So there is a process of observing, a process of observation. So the unity of consciousness is actually, has actually within it already, inherent within it, the three values of observer, observed, and process observation. Now, who is the observer? I'm asking. Consciousness. Who is being observed? Consciousness. Consciousness. What's the process of observing? Consciousness. Consciousness. So unity is there, yet three values are there. Why? By its own nature of being consciousness, it has three values within itself. This is how the symmetry breaks. And the next will be in the next session. And we'll see how the whole universe will actually come very comfortably from that reality. Can you use language? By law, to get a better understanding. I mean, say, it is a noun, a verb, or an uh, Or if we go back to some of our uh, books on scriptures and say, I am the lamb. So it has also been described as amnes. So this is amnes, am which we consider to be a verb, you know, from to be. Is it a verb? Is it an adverb? I think this is what we can handle the next session. Because first we, we go through the dynamics of how this consciousness differentiates into multiplicity. And understand that, understanding that, it will be easier to look at that. Because the verb is a process. <laughs> and the, the noun is, um, you know, is, is um, a state, if you like, a condition. And so it's a very interesting topic, but it'll take us into more philosophical considerations, which maybe we can leave to the next session. There was a question. Yeah, maybe one question will be in the next session also, when we, when we address uh, whether a monkey or a tree has consciousness. Yeah. Because, because my question is, I'm curious if there's a debate about whether or not consciousness, being a unified field, is a very human-centric point of view, right? Is it the laws of nature, uh, apply you know, to all these things, trees, animals, the planets, all the way down the stream theory. And then below that is unified field, and then that's consciousness. That's very human centric. So, how, how does it apply? That's correct. That's exactly what we'll be answering in the next session. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be answering all these questions, actually. So, you have to come next time. <laughs> Um, some, some people have, would be very happy that if the universe is a dark and empty place, and other people would like it to have some personal feeling to it. So if we start with um, the idea that this field, which, is, which everything comes from and which is still itself and has not really manifested, is just a field, uh, I, I don't want to, shouldn't take away the word just, but is a field, um, are we sort of um, saying that it's very impersonal and, and that nothing matters and all those kinds of feelings? Or is it somehow going to feel like um, it's personal? It could have some personal aspects very to it question. and that we feel you know, we're part of it and so forth. You know? Very, very important question. Because if we say consciousness, we're going to come to the question of, is this consciousness person? Does it have anything personal in it? Or is it just the mechanics? Uh, an impersonal mechanics just arising within itself. And the two are true. Both are true. Both are true. It's a complex answer, but the way it will be answered is all possibilities are there. Because as you will see, the mechanics of dynamics of transformation of consciousness 
leads to all kinds of possibilities. One of them, one out of many, can be very personal. And many others can be impersonal. So both are true, and it's, it you know, relates also to the question of whether anything else is conscious. There is nothing but consciousness. So how is it that we will say that the atom is conscious? Is the tree conscious? Is the monkey conscious? To what extent it is conscious? See, and it can lead to the idea of, you know, is there something as a creator or as not? Or, or is it, you know, that's what you're trying indirectly to say a little bit, that, you know, it's not just like a mechanical thing that's taking place. We're starting with consciousness, so that's already quite a relief in terms of, you know, the mechanical dynamics of what mm -hmm. comes about. to understand the relationship between God and consciousness because the creator, which is part of every religious um, system, is always there. But at the same time, we want to know that matter is an appearance within consciousness. So even that appearance, how does that relate to the It's the same question, basically, yes. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? The question about where is God in all of this? <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if um, there were any studies in, in looking into the brain of how ch children assimilate reality, because it seems that the level of conscious consciousness or analysis of awareness of being learning or anal in analyzing is very different because it seems that they they're not necessarily conscious of learning whereas if i learn a language today i'm going to be conscious of learning the language today whereas when i am a, ch a child i i absorb this in this very um, uh, natural way yeah this comes back to the implicit learning and yeah. children yeah children do have implicit learning at the beginning before they kind of start looking at it from their self and acknowledging who they are and being conscious of what they're learning. Children learn a lot by uh, uh, copying, by uh, um, copying <coughs> others, imitation, by imitation at the beginning. They learn a lot. The brain is, you know, you show them something or you say something to them, they learn actually the mechanics of it. Uh, not by intellectually analyzing it. So there is a primordial learning, which is implicit learning, that doesn't come from necessarily analyzing the steps of learning. For example, you teach child golf to play golf. They will not learn by as much by you have to do this, and you have to do that. This comes, but you'll show them how it is, and they learn. They don't in a conscious of the specifics. You know, they see it, they repeat it. The brain kind of takes a picture and repeats that. That's how they learn mostly at the beginning. And then later, of course, you add to that uh, intellectual <coughs> understanding and some things that they have to do that they couldn't see because maybe it happened too fast when you were showing them something. And if it happens too fast, there is this masking process that takes place. You can't see all the very fine details of the movement. So you have to bring it to the attention. When you bring it to the attention, it gets registered. So do we, do we have any idea of when, does, when do we become conscious? Yeah. Uh, when you mostly, um, you know, the child's consciousness is seen as if it's quite uh, expanded in a sense of uh, everything is the self in a way at the beginning, before they start seeing themselves as an individual. So there is consciousness, of course. Consciousness is everywhere, but it's more total. And it starts when they start saying I and mine and recognize that it's them. And the children usually always talk about themselves at the beginning in the third, like he is doing or, you know, 
Tommy wants this or, uh, you know. Does that, teach us, does that teach us about the monkey's consciousness, so the tree's Yes, 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 beautiful. Yes, it's true. Gives us an idea, and also, you know, brain damage experiments can give you an idea. If somebody's damaged in this way or that way, how they evaluate things and do things, so you can look at the animals who don't have those parts anyway, and can have an idea that maybe they're acting with a, a lower uh, level of consciousness, much more automated, less. So when we understand, for example, how the lower parts of the brain work um, and to what level they are conscious or not or involved in consciousness, and then you compare it to animals who don't have these parts, the higher parts, you can imagine that the animal's experience is, what is it like? It's, you know, it's taking the experience from this level, lower level of the brain, and the other is not as much available to them. So the more we understand about how the brain works, and the more we can see the difference between different species or different people, the more we will evaluate the refined or less refined levels of awareness and understanding. So did Descartes do us a huge disservice when he limited us by saying, I think, therefore, I am. Well, he uh, no, he did. He he was a philosopher, and he had an idea. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, there was no way at that time to believe that the body could be kind of uh, as unreal as modern science today allows us to think and stand and uh, you know and say it f full face, you know, because. The senses say differently. And at that time, nobody could deny the existence of the body. And yet, they have the intuition that it's changing. The body's changing all the time. I was a little boy and then grew up. It's a different body. It's a different structure. He was a, you know, he was a driver. He became a doctor. He was a basketball player. He became, uh, I don't know, a physicist or something. And so your role has changed. Your your body has changed. There is not even one atom in your body now that was there, you know, 40 years ago. And uh, so everything has changed. The structure has changed. It has evolved. It has changed. And your, your role has changed. You still keep that name. You could even have changed it if, you know, <laughs> for whatever reason. And still you have that sense of self that I am and I am. So. This consciousness that stays with you, that is you, is the self, is part of the problems that are discussed in consciousness. How do we maintain that sense of self and refer to it throughout life and recognize it as one while the physical is completely changed? So they had that knowledge of the change of the body. And because it changed, it says, I can't count on this thing which is changing. But my consciousness is there, and that one I can count on, and therefore I know that it's true. It's not an illusion, because these ideas of illusionary and this was was there in in the ancient knowledge of Vedas and and the, you know the Vedic structures and ancient knowledge of India. The whole thing used to be considered Maya. Maya means illusion. It's all an illusion. So, it's the philosophers, the thinkers have already thought about that. But today, we can say it with a straight face because we have physics and, and you know, modern findings that actually tell us, how much can you trust your senses? How much can you trust that you are here? You are here, of course, but are you also in some other place having some different story? I mean, there's not a point in this course to, to go into this, but the reality that is offered to us by modern understanding is allowing us actually to realize the possibility of the primacy of consciousness and how the mechanics of the dynamics of consciousness can lead to the physical world, to the reality of existence, to everything. But what is it made of? That is the issue. The made of is out of the unified field. 
and we only perceive it on a gross level as we do because of our nervous system having only that capacity. But to understand that, you'll ask me, but where did the nervous system come from? But that's what we will deal with next time. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.